once you start seeing the game for what it actually is and that this game is revealed through everything behind the scene, well, there is where the success actually lays. If you become famous and you're just a complete degenerate, it's done. Yeah. People will not respect you anymore. You, you've got to really be careful about how you navigate your connections and relationships. Isa, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for making the trip out to Miami. I know it's not that much of an arm pull to get down here. It's a pretty cool place, but I really appreciate you coming on and I'm excited to dive into the story. Thanks, Ben. Happy to be here. Let's just roll right into it. Get into it. You came from some humble beginnings. You were faced with some adversity very early in your life. You had your father pass away. And doing my research on you, you were so hardworking at a young age, and I think you really realized that. Give people listening a little bit of an insight to that part of your life. Yeah, I mean, dude, it's um, it, it's kind of interesting when you when you come into that sort of a, a shocking loss from day one, you know? Um, you start sort of looking at life through a different lens automatically. Like it's, I, I think you're kind of in, but maybe inhumane if you don't. And I'll tell you why. Um, the moment that you realize the closest person that you have leaned on, let's say as, as your rock or whatever you call it, right. is no longer there. It is the most vulnerable fucking feeling you'll ever feel. And once you're in that stage and you become conscious of the fact, no, this is real. This ain't some dream. This ain't some, um, you know, fiction that you're part of. This is the actual reality of your life. Um, it triggers some pretty interesting emotional responses out of it, uh, which, as I'm sure we'll later dig into, come out in how you also become, I think, financially successful because there's a lot of triggers to vulnerability in financial success as well that are very similar to what I went through through loss of my father. Yeah, so it was um, interesting times. Yeah, and, and from there, you earn high school, you're going to pilot school, you're learning to play the drums. Yeah. Were you always extremely disciplined? Because, I mean, that is, that's not something that's super easy to do. And I know I was in high school, I wanted to hang out with a bunch of people, yeah. do be out at the parties, partying. Like, how were you so disciplined right off the bat? Well, I, I always called selective discipline, <laughs> but... Um, I was disciplined with the things that mattered to me at the time. And, um, after my father passed, you know, it was interesting. My mother took an, that as a, you know, as a sort of opportunity to show me, listen, dude, you've got two paths here, right? Literally two paths. You can either go and self-destruct, ruin yourself, become the thing that's going to be your victim story, right? Or for lack of better terms, you can go and turn this into triumph, right? And <clears throat> when you look into high school, there is everything that's temp you know, tempting is there, right? Yeah. Drugs, alcohol, girls, whatever you want to call it, right? As a guy, as a young guy too, um, yeah, it's easy to get sort of triggered by those those temptations and and fall for it. But when I started seeing it for what it is, I recognized that you know what, man, if I just if I could just go down a path of of finding success, whatever that is, right? For me at the time, I was passionate with drumming and flying. Mm-hmm. That's what it was. I didn't really think too much more about money. I knew I didn't want to be vulnerable, right? But to me, like the the length of my mindset was, okay, if I fly airplanes, you know, that's a six-figure salary. That's better than anything I've ever experienced before. So why not go for that, right? Um, yeah, so I pursued flying at 15 years of age, dude. I started uh, going to flight school. Um, and uh, by 18, which was around the 2008 financial crisis, I uh, came into the workforce fully licensed to fly. And no jobs because nobody was hiring at the time. So I got into the drumming, the drumming side, which was, which had been with me since I was four years old. I've been drumming since I was four, man. So yeah, it's been with me for a while. I've actually noticed recently, like in successful people, there's actually typically a music background. I've had a, a handful of guests that have come on and they sang when they were younger, played an instrument. Like my last guest that came on was a professional saxophone player. Yeah. And it was interesting when I saw that you were a professional drummer and you, 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 you do speak about how you picked this up at an early age. Was that just natural? Did you have music around you as a young child, anybody in your family, or is that just what you wanted to do? Um, so no, like going back to, if you go back to my earlier days, like being like four years old and five years old in that space in my life, man, um, we were refugees in Sweden. So we didn't come to Canada until I was in my teenage years. Uh, refugees in Sweden, you have a pretty scarce life. Like that's a pretty rough way of living. Um, and there was just something in like 
playing rhythm for some yeah. reason that was a full expression for me right i don't know and it's it, the strangest thing ever is that you know part of like a companion of my success today possibly because i think one thing that you know drumming specifically i mean the drummers that listen to this show will know uh there is an intense amount of discipline to play the right notes the right sort of dynamics the the, the right discipline of creativity without taking over the stage right because if you got a singer she's out there or he's out there doing their thing you can't be out there doing a drum solo yeah even though it's tempting to pull that off right so yeah, there, I think there is definitely an ebb and a flow to, to play music where you learn creativity even though like the next bar is still to be played. Like, you still have to play the next bar yeah. afterwards. It's not complete yet, so you're still in charge of that game, but you can't be crazy about it either. It's it's weird. Yeah, no. I mean, <laughs> it's, in, it's, it's interesting because yeah. I, I agree with you. Like From that perspective, discipline is so important, and I think as I've grown up, being disciplined is the difference between being successful and unsuccessful. Yeah. Like at the core, everybody that I've had on this show that is extremely successful goes through and talks about different ways that they're disciplined and yeah. that discipline has impacted their life. And you finding that at an early age through drumming, I think for sure had an impact on the individual you are now and yeah. at least a reason why you're so successful. Yeah, I could see it, man. Um, I, you know, I keep calling it selective discipline. Yeah. I call it because, you know what, man, I've, I've built this theory in my life, at least, it, and I might change my mind with this, but um, in my mind, dude, life is typically a matter of you've got four corners, but you can only fit three in, mm. okay? There's usually an edge sticking out, and I think that goes for anyone. It, it could be, you know, in this case of discipline, you've got, you know, things that I'm disciplined in, and there's things I'm not disciplined in, you know? And I'm not perfect. Yeah. That's the reality of it. Like just making a lot of money and being successful with that and learning to network in business and, and even grow businesses. And I've taken companies public and done the whole side of that deal where you're around a lot of high net worth people. And, you know, you, when you come across through a human side of money, you realize that their shit also stinks. <laughs> it, and it stinks and no one's got it all figured out, no matter how successful they are. Yeah. And, Again, I, I reference just because my reference to successful individuals is people that sit in the seat right here and, and chat with me is a lot of people are like, don't meet your heroes. Mm -hmm. you, you will be a little disappointed. They lo might look perfect on yeah. social media or perfect in the internet, but when you meet them in person, they're also dealing with their own vices and they're struggling in their own ways. Maybe it's not financially, but it's not all sunshine and roses on the other side. Yeah. And I... I think it was Casey's show where I heard you talking about kind of you, you, you started this professional drumming, you're around professional individuals and you realize like everybody's just human. Yeah. There's nothing special about these people other than their talent that people see from the outside. Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, it's, there's something when you're around famous people, right? Where you start recognizing that, I'm not going to say everybody doesn't want to be famous. I'm not going to ever, because there's people who certainly, you know, really enjoy fame and, yeah. and that's kind of part of their persona and their identity. But you start recognizing really quickly that, you know, the ultimate nth degree of fame still ends up in you being human. And if you're a likable person, usually your fame will continue. And if you become famous and you're just a complete degenerate, it's done. Yeah. People will not respect you anymore. Right. So, that inner battle of, of how you show up as a human being, regardless of the power and influence and whatever that the impact is that you have on other people around you, um, I think you cannot undermine the fact in the end that you've got to be a person that people actually want to spend time with, um, learn from, listen to, and also be heard. Like, you know, I think one of the things that people really want is they want to be heard and understood. That, that's the number one thing I've learned in business. Yeah. Is if if I can make you feel heard and make you feel understood, you'll be ninety nine point nine 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 times more likely to do business with me than if I'm just here trying to overlord some concept because I have X amount of experience that you might not have. You might have a genius idea that I, as the success lord, let's just call it right, mm -hmm. I've never thought about. Do you think that's just in everything in life? Like people just want to be heard. That sometimes it's hard for individuals where you kind of feel like you're in a rut or people aren't listening to you. Because I, I couldn't agree more. Like I'm in sales and 
there is that part of it where you need to connect with that other individual on the yeah. other part because people buy from people. Like that's just the way that works. And by you making that person feel comfortable and heard, that's might be the reason why you go and get that sale. Yeah. You think that's just natural in everybody? Yeah. Cause I think, and I, you know, <laughs> I, and I want to word this, like, I hope the audience understands where I'm coming from, where I'm saying this, man. But like, I think there is a victim story in every person's mind if they choose to listen to it. And I think that the first path of empathy, if that makes sense, right, is letting someone be in their state of whatever story they, they feel is important to them, right? Yep. And and like letting them sort of let that out, feel heard, feel seen, feel understood for what that problem, challenge, obstacle is in their life. And then if you can just sort of, you know, sort of shine a light on the other side, okay, this is an alternative now. Um, do you want to come along? Right. Yep. Do, do you want to go and do this together? Right. Do you want to solve th this concept? I think once you sort of give people that stage um, to be what they are, there is only the, the, you know, the ability to change from that point forward. You can change from there. If you just go into someone's mind and just try to spill info, they're not going to be receptive. I always look at, I'm sure you're in sales. This makes sense to you. Empty someone's mind mm -hmm. so you can actually feed the info in. Yep. Garbage out so you can put the good, you know, good info in. And um, yeah, I think that's been a lot of sort of, I'm not going to call them secrets, but sort of like the pillars to my success outside of trading, outside of flying, outside of drumming. And, and just de being around a lot of important, you know, famous people is just how you deal with them is you see them for the humans they are first regardless of their fame, success, whatever. And you don't look at them as like a weird species that like, you know, are rare to find, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You're 18, 19, 20 range here. You got your pilot license, yeah. no employment, nothing. We were in that 2008 period. What, what, what's going through your mind at that moment? What are you doing? I think from what I heard, drumming was that outlet during that time. Yeah. How was that experience? I'm going to be a rock star, man. That, yeah. that, that was what's going on in my mind. I'm going to be a rock star, right? Yeah. Um, I was uh, I was band, playing for a band called Kilmore Place in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. And they had a little bit of buzz. Okay, so I'm not going to lie. Like, this this band, well, when we were on the Arising, like, when we would do shows, it'd sell, you know, 500 people, which is not bad. No, for, that, that's a lot. You know, back in 08, Facebook was a new thing. You know, there wasn't much online reach. Yeah. Right? So to have that buzz organically at that at that sort of time was pretty cool. I don't know if, you know, the only band, Arkells, they're a bigger band now. They're from, from, from Canada. We were side by side of them at the time. And, you know, I got the chance to to start drumming for this mm -hmm. cool group. And um, it was just phenomenal because the experience that came from that, it actually shaped a lot of the lessons that I now talk about my life because yeah. there, there came a point where um, there was a fork in the road for me where I was done sort of playing drums and, and I was, you know, playing successful shows with them, but the flying thing opened up mm -hmm. and, and my mind of sort of safety going after a career, et cetera, et cetera, ended up not leaning into the thing that was my drumming and leaning into the safe sort of, let me go and get my career sorted out. And, and then I ironically figured out that that was the wrong decision in the end. You started your career, got into flying. Yeah. At what point did you realize you wanted to be a pilot? Did that? I know. And I asked the same question about yeah. drumming because it is <laughs> two pretty unique paths. You don't meet a lot of pilots <laughs> and you don't meet a lot of drummers. So at what point were you like, I love aviation and I want to fly. Um, it would have been around five years of age. Um, we were on a trip from uh, what was it, from the UK to the Middle East. I think we we're just going back home to visit family. And uh, yeah, we just took off from London and uh, I was just right behind the wing. <laughs> and it was storming as hell, man. Like it was the rain showers, wind. It was just a disgusting evening. We're taking off. And... When we took off, all I could see was all these parts on the wing moving up and down, the wings flapping up, and I was just doing all these insane things. And I thought to myself, and we're, and we're jumping around like with the turbulence just right after to take off. And I thought to myself, man, whoever does this, whoever's in charge of these many people's lives right now is probably the coolest badass that I would love to love to one day be able to just even be like, right? Yeah. I don't know why that came in my mind, yeah. but that was the thought that came in. Um, and from, you know, for like sort of aviation lovers on your channel, I was a... Uh, it was a Boeing 747-100. So it was a 100 series classic series. And uh, man, um, yeah, since that point, it uh, 
I wanted to be that badass, that hero, whoever that was dealing with that for a little kid, right? That was my, that was my desire. Awesome. Yeah. You, and I know when you start in flight school or you're an early pilot, maybe I'm wrong, but I think you can only fly during the day yeah. and it's only good weather. Um, as you try and learn, you get through that period. Then you start requesting only PM flights. Mm -hmm. I know why, but what's the reason why you only wanted those PM flights? Yeah, well, there's a couple of reasons, man. So the first reason is when you start flying at night, the whole game changes, right? I mean, you're even though you're you're starting out flying, you know, with with day rules. Um, once you start flying at night, like that's just with the basic one, the oxygen levels drop, so you can't see as well. Yeah, your senses, your perceptions, your illusions start actually firing up on on, on a very different way. So learning to train that environment is obviously a necessary component of becoming a professional, right? Yep. If you're gonna learn to fly people. Uh, or whatever in the future, you got to learn to fly at night. So that was one thing. Um, the other aspect of it too is uh, in order to get your highest level license in the end, right? It's called the airline transport pilot license. You need to have X amount of night hours. Otherwise, they won't actually trust you with the highest level license that lets you fly um, passengers and big airline jets and stuff, yeah. right? So yeah, so th those two reasons really fall into, into why I wanted to get the evening flights and try to knock those out as fast as I could. Yeah, yeah. and then... You start to get into stocks, trading, that world. That also, I'm sure, played into why you'd want a PM flight. Now you yeah. can trade during the day, work at night. Yeah. You're kind of doing two jobs at once here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was more so after I got my licenses done. I, I realized um, very quickly in my flying career, dude, that, uh, you know, you've got to you, you've gotta really be careful about how you navigate your connections and relationships. Um, yeah. And, and when I, once I realized that, you know, that the flying career is a beautiful career, fantastic career. It's got a lot of greatness to it, but it comes on the back end of kind of like an iron fist. That's always ready to slap you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I realized that, I, you know, me being, I always call myself a little bit of a, maybe like a bit of a rebel. Like I don't usually always follow narratives. I like sort of, creating change, creating sort of positive outlook on, on doing things better. Yeah. And in an industry that's so set in its ways, um, it's, it oftentimes found itself not wanting my input. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's okay. Because what's funny is years later, you look at the things that you were suggesting that, that, you know, people in time didn't want to implement. Right. And then you see, Oh wow. They just implemented the very thing that I talked about 10 years ago. Yep. Right. It's okay. And the whole point is there's like, there's no chip there on my shoulder. What, what it created was the reality. Listen, this industry is not ready for you yet in that sense. Yeah. If you want to progress the way that you envision success, you might have to sort of spread your wings outside of flying. Yeah. And yeah. I can relate from a perspective of, I started a few companies early on, had success, and then I wanted more stability. COVID unfortunately was a derailer of those yeah, companies. And fair enough. There was some turmoil there, but I wanted more stability, so I went into corporate America, and I started to realize like how slow moving, pol political it kind of can be. And you might have the great idea or the solution, that doesn't mean they're gonna listen to you or implement no. it because that person, oh, I, maybe I should have thought about it. Well, I don't want my boss to think that the person under me thought all of that good stuff. Right. And that was very eye opening to me. And now, I mean, I. I've never met anybody from the aviation industry. Yeah. So it's interesting to hear that you say, I mean, I'm getting the sense it's somewhat similar. Yeah. And would you say that the aviation industry is, is still a little like 10 years behind on, on just regular, is it like it's a, a slower, it's older a, industry? Yeah, it's such a strange industry in that sense because in so many ways it's a, it's like a pioneer in mm -hmm. like technological yeah. advances and the things that we do, right? To improve safety, to improve like just the overall efficiency of the thing, right? It's such a pioneer and has so many obligations to meet, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then there, there exists almost this like this lagging piece to it that that are the operators up front that, you know, because it's such a, I got to be careful how I word this because I don't want to make sure that I want to make sure this comes through exactly how I want it to come yeah. through. It's an important job because in the moment that you screw up, it's everybody's lives at once. Yeah. It's not like a doctor's life where they're responsible for one surgery at a time. Right? Like if I'm if I don't see something and that something leads to something else that leads to something else that's the cause of the accident now, 
Well, now you're talking, you know, hundreds of people. Yep. And that's just on board. That's not the people that you might impact on the ground. So undoubtedly with the career comes a sense of importance to the individual that's in charge of this, doesn't there? This is almost like an easy trap for an ego yep. to feel like, well, I know mm-hmm. I, you know, I'm in, I mean, you know, I'm a captain or whatever, right? It's normal. And I think it's almost an unconscious thought process because I don't think people mean to feel special. I think people just find that they identify themselves through the job they do. And when your job involves the responsibility of hundreds of people at times, it's important to, it, sorry, it's important to be conscious that there's still other ways of thinking, right? And I think because people get stuck in the sort of ego of, well, I'm a so-and-so and, and I have my ideas, who are you to tell me that this idea is, is wrong? It can hinder progress. It does, but the pe- I, I got to say this too. The people are, for the most part, they're fantastic people. Mm-hmm. But it's just that this is a culture yeah. of how this industry runs. Um, yeah. And there is there is a saying, and I and I kind of, you know, it, it kind of points to what I'm getting at is like the saying is, you know, assholes don't cra- crash airplanes. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. They don't. Interesting. Right? Yeah. Um, there is examples where arrogance has crashed airplanes, mm-hmm. but not being to the point, being a type A personality, it, it hasn't really showed that. We have one example that that we pull on in aviation, it's the Tenerife Kalem crash that happened with Pan Am, um, where the captain didn't want to listen to the remainder of the crew, right? Um, but in it, in essence, right, people who are very good at their jobs in this industry, um, there's a very good reason for it. There's an ego behind them. Yeah, no, and, and I think, yeah, I think that's in a lot of different yeah. things. Ego, <laughs> ego true. plays like you. You need a certain swagger to be successful, and I just think that's like a non-negotiable. Yeah, like you have those kind of Steve Jobs type people. Like that, you might not. The word swagger might not be the right way, but they had that chip on their shoulder, that way yeah. they approach things, and I think that's just natural in in any successful individual, and it can be all the way up to Steve Jobs level. Or somebody that's working a regular job but excels at that job. Yeah. They probably have a swagger to them that separates them from the kind of baseline individual. Yeah. Um, ironically, I will say this too, that like, you know, when you come across humility in a role that has every right to feel special, mm-hmm. right? I know that's when the most sort of beautiful form of I think a human mastery starts forming itself, right? Because it's like, okay. It's like when you come across someone super famous, right? Yeah. They have every reason to probably dismiss you because they've got 20,000 other things that they think are priorities. But if they take that second and talk to you, your likability towards them goes up, your loyalty towards them goes up, and as a result, the teamwork inspired all around boosts up and everyone's on the same page. 100%. Right? 100%. So um, I think one of the the biggest things that I still appreciate by aviation, and people still ask me, hey, why do you still fly? I'm like, well, it's, it's, a, very, it's a very well-rounded question. But... There's just something about the the innate discipline in flying that comes with the uh, with the need for humility, because effectively, so my role, so I still fly as a captain even today, right? I'm still responsible to make sure that the persons beside my crew members, right, that they are well taken care of to the point where they also have growth in their path, mm-hmm. whatever that path is. If it's going to be if they're flying career great, if it's as a human, then whatever, right? But but there's a coaching aspect to it almost where you're coaching other people to become better so they can one day take your spot. Right. Yeah. And that's how the industry evolves and becomes the industry that you see today. That the yeah. whole world relies on the world relies on the aviation still. Yeah. No, I mean, like I, I just, I got off a plane last night. Yeah. You got here on a plane. Like, you were in Minnesota, weren't you? I was in Minnesota. Yeah. I, was yeah. Say, I saw your story. Yeah. It was uh <laughs> freezing. Nice. I'm much, I'm very happy to be back. Um, in good? Miami. Yeah. It was awesome. I, I, a work trip where I could go to a football game, a hockey game, yeah. and the, I love sports, so it, it's okay. been for me. Good, good, man. So we've kind of gone off this like we've got hard aviation <laughs> here. Um, yeah, businesses. You you you've taken you like you say you've taken companies public. Yeah, you've been extremely successful in the stock market. Take me through where that came from. Yeah, so I think it kind of goes back to the beginning days of actually aviation, where I've realized you know what. My personality style was probably going to run into a lot of conflict up front right mm-hmm. in this industry because I was just very outspoken. I was going to sit back and watch a lot of stuff. Yeah. And that's not to say that I wasn't willing to listen, but I just, I had a lot of solutions, but you know, industry was kind of tough to accept it. So I realized, you know what, if, if I'm going to be original in my own identity, 
as a person that that succeeds in my in my version of success, right? Uh, I've got to do something different. Yeah. Right. And you know, I looked at business. I really did look at the, you know what if I do this? What if I do that? Like you know, I have these ideas and I'm implementing them, and they're all various different types of ideas. But then I looked at some of the int- most interesting stats, and the stats were listen the the failure rate in business is like 96th, 97th percentile. Like like 97% of people who get into business fail. Yep. They don't succeed. They don't make a dollar before their thing's bankrupt and they got to start over again. And then I looked at the trading stats and it was 90th percentile, which is lower than business, which means that people find more success with trading than they find in business. So the odds of success automatically are a bunch more fold better if I just somehow, I don't know how yet, but somehow figure out the stock market. And then when I looked at like the individuals that partake in the game of the stock market, I started studying them. Like, you know what? Like the elite are hanging out in here. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if they have real estate in this. Ultimately, the stock market is the game that hedges all the debts of a capital market and all the insurances against it. So there's a reason for that. So once I realized that, wow, if the wealthiest are hanging out in here, maybe I should start learning this game. And yeah, that's where the journey started, man. And did you start reading books? How did you learn that? And at what point did you say, like, this is something I'm going to start doing full time? Yeah, trial and error <laughs> in the beginning, you know. Um, yeah, it was a lot of just thinking that my gut feeling was going to get me rich. Yeah. You know, like, like most people, how they start, oh, you know, this idea, I think that, you know, whoever was it on Bitcoin, if they could repeat that investment, I would call them a genius. But most people who get home runs in the stock market, they literally got, you know, they got lucky. And, and I think I kind of approached it in the beginning too, with a bit of a, I'm lucky, you know, I want to be lucky mentality. I kind of want to, you know, get my, my lottery win out of the stock market. And once I realized extremely quickly that, that this game is going to ruin me quicker than it's going to, you know, help me find success. Yeah. Um, it forced me to start taking a deep look into why was I losing money? And all, and oftentimes like, the first couple of years, I was losing money consistently, and it wasn't until about year three where it turned around to be, you know, break even. But the thing is, when I started tracking why I am doing what I'm doing and what's leading to success, what's leading to break even, what's leading to loss, you start seeing consistencies in in basically your pattern based behavior, pattern based thought processes um, that create your actions. And once I started seeing that, oh my god, 99 times out of 100, the success for me came from understanding the story behind the stock it changed the game most people they chase stock they just chase ideas like a lineup for a bar you know like you go to a bar and mm-hmm. there's a big lineup people are like, oh my god that must be a good bar right they just chase the next person's idea they're not really original but once you start seeing the companies for what they actually are then you can actually start seeing value and lack of value and perceived value and capitalize on those you get success in year three mm-hmm how do you continue to push through year one and two of, of failures? Because 99.9% of people are quitting after probably six months of, yeah. of failure. How do you get through that to push through? And kind of, I think of that one meme where it's the person walking away with their pickaxe and yeah. that one swing away from the diamonds and that other person is just continuing to hack away. Yeah. How, how'd what you get through that? Them? I think it was, if I go back to like the, the, the story of like my father passed, right? Remember I was said that my mother said, listen, you got two paths here. <laughs> one's the victim story. One's the story of triumph. That fork in the road happened again with the markets, right? I could either sort of pack it together and say, you know what? You know, the market's rigged, <laughs> right? The market yeah. Star Wars a gamble. The, the, the typical narratives that, you know, I call unconscious minds partaken <laughs> as opposed to saying, you know what? Isa, you suck. <laughs> Learn this. Yeah. You 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 literally are screwing up on this, 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 and this. Right? Have the guts to face that and figure out why you're doing it and go into it until you until you figure out what the problem is, right? I think that weird obsession of like being willing to not be perfect. Um that that's it. The, there's an imperfection in this path for sure. It started as, as massive imperfection. And so I forget who tweeted it. A recent guest tweeted, and I actually think it might have been Presley that um, tweeted um, saying entrepreneurship and business ownership is just self-development. And 
what you say makes me think of that because even for this podcast, when I started it, I'm like, dude, I'm good at sales. Like, I don't need to prepare. I don't need right. to. I can just chat with somebody and it'll come out good. Right. And, it, and it was fine, but it lacked that like quality. And I went in and I said, okay, what am I doing that? What am I not doing? And it's like, oh, well, I'm not doing an extensive amount of research. I go and start doing that research and the quality of episodes is 10x. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, okay. So I look back and say, all right, how can I do better research? Right. The quality of episodes goes up 20x. Yeah. And it was me just kind of developing as an individual because I didn't have that ego where like, dude, I don't, I don't need to do any of this. Like I'm good at what I do. Like yeah. I think I'm good. And I think that's business. And like, you just explained it right there. Yeah. It wasn't the stock market. It wasn't that finger pointing. It was pointing the fingers back at you and saying, how do I, Isa, get better at this? Yeah. And now look at you. And like, I, I think it's, it's amazing how there's those experiences where there, if we would have ran your story through an algorithm a thousand times, Probably 999 of them quit before yeah. it gets to year three. You were the one that pushed through. It's like, I don't know if you're a Marvel fan, but when Doctor Strange looks yeah. at that moment and there's like <laughs> 10,000 chances and they're like, there's one chance we make it and they make it. Yeah. It's kind of gives me that vibe from you. And I think it's important for people listening to hear that because I see so much short sightedness yeah. in this generation on like, Oh, well, I didn't have success in the first three months, so I canned that idea. Or I didn't have success in the first three weeks, so I was like, why am I going to continue on? This is a perfect example of why you keep pushing through if it's something you're passionate about. Yeah, I agree, man. Um, I, I tell you, man, there's a real human aspect to this where you're like, do I just stop this now? Like, yeah. do, I just, do, do I just like stop this naive thought process? Like, I mean, how could, you know, this this identity i'm going to speak to you this is this is my inner language at the time right how could you think as like some immigrant kid that's here in canada you're going to go and play with the elite the elite with you know hundreds of years of generations and understanding of, of how wealth works in this country like like who do you think you are right it's almost like i was confirming the narrative of the very entity that at the time i used to think didn't want me to succeed right yeah but that was the victim story yep right because the reality is that that's not true. You know, when you take a look at any sort of meaningful entity that's doing good in the world, right? They want others to succeed. Yeah. Right? And I know that in this, we're in this weird sort of time frame right now where there's a lot of sort of inconsistent hate towards rich people, right? Mm -hmm. There is. Yeah. I almost call it like a joker mayhem, yep. right? And the reason I call it joker mayhem is because there's so much struggle on one side. And there's so much money on the other side. And the struggle thinks that the money is going to solve their issue. And the reality is that the money is only going to solve their issue for today, tomorrow, the next few years. But if you can't still have a process in place to repeat that money, your kid, your grandchild, your whatever is still going to end up starving. Yep. So on the rich side, it's phenomenal because there exists two kinds of people there too, I find. That there's two kinds of rich people. There's a kind of rich people person that, you know, is like, you know what? I want to make the world better. Mm -hmm. I don't want people to suffer, right? And that's and that's the sort of lens that I I like partaking in, right? With caveats, and I'll talk about those caveats if you want. But then there is the ego of the money, where there is some real rich assholes that almost rather the poor understand why they should stay in their lane. And once you start seeing that, okay, well, even as a rich person, you have a, a, a real choice in how you amplify your existence, um you have a real shot of making the world a great place because I think that as a rich person, you have the most finite resource that's going to help most people. So I always say, how do you fix, how do you fix social issues? It starts with a handout, but it completes the story full, full circle with education. You got to help people understand what they don't know. And for you, if you're on the poor side, middle-class side, you have to be humble enough to recognize that you have absolutely no idea what a lot of money means so don't think for a second that you know what you would do or live life like when you have a lot of it. I come across this all the time. I'll, if I can just riff on this for a bit. Riff. So, so as I say, I still contract as a captain, right? Mm -hmm. I fly Airbuses, Boeings for fun. Yeah. Okay? Because uh, we can talk a while later, but it all came down to, I love so much that goes into aviation, right? You know what I always come across? Well, you if you're so rich, why are you still doing this? Right. Yeah, because... And I'm like, well, you don't get it, do you? Yeah. 
you don't you don't fucking understand, do you? And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, okay, here's a check for 10 million bucks. What are you doing? Oh, I'm going to go travel. I'm going to, you know, spend time with my kids. I'm going to do this and this and that. I was like, okay, so now you do it. Now what? Your kids return. Your kids are growing up. They're off. They go. They do their thing. They don't care about you anymore. Probably, right? Realistically, <laughs> most kids move on with their lives and they, they live their lives. Oh, well, I'm just gonna, you know, sit on the beach. Oh, so you're just gonna sit there, brain dead, drink until you're till you die. Yeah. That's that's your narrative with money. No fucking kidding. You have no money. That's your mindset, right? The reality is that once you get to a lot of money, I call it. You have. You've almost been given a chance to be reborn. You're rebirthed into this beautiful blank page of how do you want to show up, right? And once I took time away from work, flying, mm -hmm. right? And I recognized that, man, you couldn't pay me or or not pay me to fly. I would still fly, man. I'd still fly that airplane regardless of how much money was in my bank account, how much money I made or didn't make. And once I realized that the correlation between me and my, my flying passion, right, that freedom that comes with it, the discipline that comes with it, had absolutely nothing to do with the career aspirations of the monetary possibilities. Um, I jump right back into it, man. You know, thank you all for listening to this podcast. Just wanted to take a quick second to give a shout out to Micromedia. Micromedia is the company that I use to essentially create this podcast that you all are consuming right now. They handle my long form editing and my short form editing. I would be pressed to find anybody that's doing better short form than we are here at virtual ventures and micromedia is the company that's making that happen so feel free to reach out to me i can put you in contact with them if that's something you're interested in um and enjoy the rest of the show yeah and i mean at least from my perspective wealth should give you the ability to go do the things that you really enjoy and i like i agree with you most people think that they enjoy the drinking and the vacation and all that. I don't think they realize that that's just not scalable. Like you're not going to travel, drink and be on a beach for 10 years in a row all the time. Yeah. Like you need passions, you need things you enjoy. And regardless of how rich you are, when you were five years old, you decided that aviation and flying was cool. What better way to be rich than to go do what yeah. you like whenever and however you want. Yeah. Man. Like, and amazing it's like i might butcher this quote but it's jim carrey said it once once he went through his you know renowned experience as a person but he said i wish every person found fame and wealth so they could realize that's not where the where the game's actually at and that that now you're just in the sort of empty field of okay well now how do i i, I gotta show up still as a person right if i'm gonna vegetate which ergo you're looking at on the camera man vegetation is it looks like this because you have no fucking purpose right so it's, it's more recently that I'm now back into the game. I'm taking health seriously, working out, you know, walking a lot, watching my diet. Um, and, and I'm, and I'm starting to get to a place of, you know what? I don't want, I don't want to live a life where I'm taking my past traumas and, and hurts and whatever that was and bring it into this reborn version that, mm -hmm. that I'm now in, I'm experiencing a beautiful reality. I want my exterior to also reflect that now. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So like the idea of I'm going to go and live an all-inclusive life if I have all this money and just drink and sit by the beach and be a useless person. Well, hey, hand hand cameras, this is what it fucking looks like. <laughs> but seriously, it's what it looks like, right? So no, that's not the fucking answer. Yeah. It's and, not. And I had a guest on a few episodes back, and they actually said, they were like, if you are not living to your full potential, that is actually selfish of you to do that. Correct. Like you are being selfish to yourself and the world. Yeah. And when he said that, I was like, whoa, like I never thought about it from that perspective because it's easy to be lazy. Like, oh, my alarm goes off for the gym, snooze, like mm -hmm. I'll, I'll go tomorrow. But when I started thinking about that from like, what a selfish move of me to like in that moment, go for that five second. Yep. Yeah, I'd rather go back to bed right now. Like that's so selfish to next year's me. And I was like, man, like that is an impactful way to look at it. And I think that is like along the lines of like what you're saying, like people want to be selfish and go live that like meaningless. I mean, maybe it that's is. not the right way to say it, but <laughs> meaningless life. And instead you should be going back. And like this person I'm speaking about literally got rich because he started his life in nonprofits, mm -hmm. didn't love the way that they did it, but wanted to fulfill his passion to give back right. and, and be a nonprofit. 
So he's like, I just got rich and did it on my own. And that's why I did it. And what did I do now? All of my energy goes towards that. Yeah. And I'm like, that's the right way to go about being rich. Like have a passion. And for you, it's similar. Yeah. You love aviation. <laughs> why would you stop doing that just because you're rich? It's moronic to think like that the, to the person that asked you that, like, or the multiple people that probably do, you said it right. That's why you're not rich. Yeah, exactly, man. It's uh, yeah, it's a fascinating lens to live life through. And I always say this to, to my closest people. I've got, so I've got the sort of, you know, I don't know if it's a luxury or a curse, but I'm going to call it whatever. It, so I've got this thing where I got to experience life around my, you know, top 1% of friends. Mm -hmm. And I'm also in the network of, of the middle class. I'm, I'm in that side. I'm sort of threading the needle between both sides and both sides. They truly don't understand each other. Mm -hmm. And I say to both sides, like, you know, either on, on the rich side, man, you really forgot where you came from in some yeah. cases and, and why you're forming these these ludicrous opinions on the on the wealth side. And on the middle class, I'm like, man, you've never been to the other side. So how could you even tell me what you would do? Man, you don't know. You don't know. You don't know. So, like, that's so arrogant to think that you have any fucking idea what you would do. Because the reality is if you actually knew what to do, you would make the money. Mm -hmm. You would do the things that would make you the income, which would show me that you probably know what to do on the other side then, don't you? Yeah. So, yeah, man, it's fascinating. It's it's polarizing. It's interesting. It's complicated. It's emotional. But it's uh, it's life that um, that I get to live. And, and I'm you know what, man? I'm super, I, I call it blessed that I get to sort of experience that dividing line. Because I think that's where you see all the action, man. It's like a border, right? Yeah. No, it's phenomenal. It's it gives you a lot of perspective. Yeah, it does, and it ties into you and your business. You you learn stock trading. You you are successful in trading stocks. Now your calling is to educate others on how to go and be wealthy and use the stock market as a vehicle to create wealth. And I think you having that perspective gives you a very real kind of way to speak to somebody because I don't want to learn about getting rich from somebody who inherited a bunch of money. Yeah. I want to learn from somebody like you who had serious challenges at a young age and had a, a tough upbringing, persevered and created this extremely successful individual. <laughs> well, I would want to learn from you. You've seen the shit and you've been there and you've created the success. Yeah. And I think that's the hardest part. People think people love handouts. Like mm -hmm. they just want like, oh, but if you did it, like I could do it too. Like show me how. And yeah. it's like, <laughs> If it was that easy, I would make all of my friends around me. Everybody would be rich. Yeah. If I could wave the wand and just be like, I'm rich too. Well, you're rich now. Yeah. You're rich now. Wouldn't we all be doing that? Yeah, we so would. You, wh where did you find the passion to want to teach people and, and help people on that journey? Yeah, this is where all my capitalist friends call me a socialist at heart. <laughs> and it's funny because I'm not. I'm not a socialist at heart, man. But um, when I start recognizing that, like, okay, there's real, really no triumph struggling, mm. right? And that all struggling truly is, is due to lack of info. If we really just dumb this down to the most basic fucking metric, the only reason poverty exists is due to lack of info. Yep. Like, if you have better information, you make better decisions. This is like basics on how we fly airplanes. Yep. Better info, better decisions, better outcome, right? Yep. If I don't know what I'm about to fly into a massive storm cloud, well, then I'm not going to probably make the decision to avoid that. I might go into it and blow up, for lack of better terms, right? Yeah. You get my point, right? So so I think if you just dumb this thing down, if you have better info, then you now have the ability to, to meet every fork in the road that is a decision with the right one, mm -hmm. right? And when I started seeing, that, okay, well, I came from nothing. I had all the reasons to believe I'm not destined to make it, right? I mean, like I said earlier, who's this immigrant kid? Is he going to play against the wealthy 1%. But but once I realized, shit, I made it, and it was as a result of sticking through the hardest parts and the hardest doubts in my life, that I just want to make that type of platform available to the person who doesn't want to come in for a handout. They're not looking for a stock pick. Mm -hmm. They're looking to figure out, okay, so what the hell are you doing and why is it working? Yep. And if I can get their attention to just give me give me a minute of your time, man, Right? Let me just show you one thing, right? That one minute typically is the thing that changes the direction for most people, right? And what I have them do, and I do this absolutely for free because I'm so frustrated is maybe the wrong word, but I'm sort of fed up with the mentality of let me charge you for information. That's BS to me. I shouldn't have to charge you for info. If I'm going to help you and I'm going to implement new habits in you and start actually working on your inner psyche, 
Absolutely. I think there's an element where you should invest in that. Mm -hmm. But showing you the information that this is why the stock market works. This is how you as a complete beginner can go and do this, 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 and see that the game works for yourself and see that one decision would have made you a 50% ROI this week while you're waiting five years for the same ROI in your 401k. If I can show you that for free, that makes you now a believer, doesn't it? Yeah. When it makes you a believer, then it opens up the narrative. Okay, do you want my help? If you want my help, let's go into this deep and yeah. start talking about, okay, how do you capitalize on this over and over so it's no longer luck? It's actually a repeated process that you can systemize, automatize, and off you go. And I think this is good for people listening because I've learned this and I've met with multiple people who sell their information to others and go about it the way that you're speaking. Most people think that you need to give people a nibble and then charge them for all of the good information. But in reality, you need to give them the good information for free yeah. because if they're actually committed, they'll take that information and come back to you and want to go deeper. Yeah. And that's kind of the person that you would want. But let me flip. I almost like to flip the script, right? So, because sometimes it can be misunderstood that, okay, I charge because, oh, I'm giving my time, mm -hmm. right? Dude, when, when you live life on passive and like your time is bought by just your investments paying for you, mm -hmm. right? You look at your time very differently. You look at it through the scale of leverage now. No longer do you look at it through the lens of, oh, I got to charge my time for dollars, right? My whole mentality with this is a real person, okay, that wants to come in here and, and reference change, the first thing that they have to get very good at is they got to get very good at trusting money. And there's no better way to trust money than to learn where to invest it. If you invest it in yourself, it's a form of you showing me, hey, buddy, I'm, I'm betting on myself. Yeah. You show me you bet on yourself, that will typically, I can't say always, because there's people who sometimes fall through the cracks, though, because there's other psychological triggers there that need to be worked on. But 99% of the time, man, people who actually bet on themselves through whatever avenue that they want to go about it, they come through the other side succeeding. And it can't be a comfortable price point. Does that make sense? Because if I make it something for nothing, it's a lottery ticket. You can come in here, put on some effort. If it doesn't work, jump okay. off. Yeah. But if I make the stakes so high that if you come in here, it actually will impact you negatively if you don't fall through, mm -hmm. you're going to fall through. And you're going to think twice about it before you actually come into working with me. So I'm not one of those guys that just wants to enroll guys at whatever level. And say, oh, come on in, work with me. No, no, no. For me, it's very important, man, that if you come into this, you're going to actually be a confirmation that this works. So what I've actually done on the nth degree of this is for the specific students of mine that work with me, once they're done, they're six month, it's six months to learn this. And it's like a full-time thing, right? But once you spend six months with me and you learn this game, in the nth degree, I give you access to my seven-figure capital, my personal capital, where the proof of concept exists. I'm fronting my own money and taking my own students to grow that capital, pay them back a commission off of that. Right? So it's like the only way this is going to prove that it's going to work is that, okay, if I can take complete beginner in six months, now they know what they're doing. Yeah. You go in here, you get to work with my big money. And once they start saying, okay, oh, okay, well, let's say we do a 50% trade, right? On, on a million dollars. Let's just say we work a million dollar account, 50% trade, 500K return. Well, we give them a 20% kickback. It's a hundred K payout to that student who had that trade idea. Pretty sweet ROI if you study your ass off. Yep. So I make the whole incentive about show the hell up and study so that we can actually get you to a place where you make money from this, right? And then once you fund them, 100, 2, 3, 400, 500 K, okay, they're going to go make their own millions at that point, right? So yeah. that's a full loop circle now where people don't only come in and invest themselves, but on the nth degree, if they show up and do the work, there is a way to pay back way more to actually go and build that life. Because a lot of people's issue is they'll invest in a program, they'll learn the skills, but they don't actually have the money or the guts to use the money to actually do anything with that information. So we close that loop altogether. Yeah, and it's really interesting to think about that because literally right at the end there, you make a point where the people might learn the skill, but they're not willing and they don't have the guts to put their capital on the line yeah. when it comes to like, all right, like let's take the training wheels off. Like let's go yep. make real money. You already know what you need to do. You're just not mentally ready to push those bigger units. Yeah you are now empowering that individual by putting your own capital on the line and saying, hey, I trust you. Correct. You've been here for six months. I know you will succeed. Yeah. You're almost breaking that for them mm -hmm. without, and like, it's, it's genius because right now I'm thinking like, 
I get it. Like I could see why that person, I mean, it's scary. Like, let's be honest. Like a lot of money is, it's, it's, it's a lot on you personally and you training those individuals up and then empowering them because you're basically giving them the playbook. Most people say like, oh, I give you the playbook, but then it's on you to go implement it and, and throw that money around. Correct. You're going one step further and saying, hey, I'm going to teach you the playbook. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you a taste of what it's like to do this at the level that I know you're capable of. And that's why I'm putting my money on the line. Yeah. You're really empowering these individuals to go out and make life-changing money for them and their families. How does that feel? Like just at a, a core basic level. What? Okay. Well, I think the feeling of it is just confirmation that this works. So I'm almost, <laughs> I hate it because I'm in a way I'm, I'm partaking in confirmation bias. But there's so much hate on the stock market topic that I'm just tired of all the BS out there. And I'm like, okay, I, at least what I'm doing in this space is I'm not just going to come in here and be like, oh, do this and do that. No, no, no. You're going to come in here. You're going to show me exactly why you made the decisions you made in the moment you made that decision. And we're going to understand why you made that decision. Once we pick that apart and do that over and over and over and over again for six months, and we get to train to a point where you can grow an account, well, there's capital over here. Right, come on over. Let's start making some serious money, and off you go and get empowered. It's confirmation that this works. That's how I feel. Yeah. And for you, and I'm, I'm getting the sense just as the way we're talking, you're not a long term like build a big portfolio type of investor. And you might do that on the side, but traditionally here we're talking about trading, day trades, options, that yeah. type of style. Is that I, correct? Well, I believe that that's your beginning umph to financial um, strength. And then diversification should happen, right? So like, you know, my passive today, all the income that I make off of passive is all sitting in funds, but yeah. they're now with private wealth, private equity banks that are now working yeah. in my capital, right? Um, that's what creates passive income for me, right? Which focuses the, the ability to do what I do now with my life, right? Yeah. Fly airplanes, drums, and, and, and teach and take companies public, right? Um, but in the end, the sort of nth degree of all this, like the last sort of, resort of where this goes to man is you know man long-term investing works i kind of make a joke of this if you're willing to wait till hip replacement yeah <laughs> like, like once you're ready for a hip replacement you can cash out your money that does not sound exciting to me man. yeah that sounds like someone who just like slaved away and lived in a scarce i gotta build my future and the future may not even ever come and I saw that the hard way with my dad died, right? The future wasn't there for him, right? We don't know what our future is. I mean, I know there was a narrative out there, oh, you're in control of this and control of that. But ultimately, ultimately, like at the highest level, right? You can be the happiest, funniest, healthiest, wealthiest, whatever person, and a piano drops in your head. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm, I mean, you, you never like, know. You know, it's unexpected. You never right? know. There's a lot of variables and there's yeah. a lot of stuff you can't control. You can't. And I think that the concept of control within itself is an interesting concept because I think it's us humans who actually think that we have control. And I think if you actually del delve into that topic a bit more, which might kind of go advanced, but if you actually go a little bit deeper in that theory, you might start to understand that there's a way bigger intelligence at play that we all even are even conscious to. And if you consider that narrative, then who's truly in control? Yeah, no, I got something. I got <laughs> something. Something I got to go back and then do some homework on. There you go. Um, I want to talk about you taking the companies public, but sure. first, there's a lot of people that listen to this podcast that are 20 to 25, okay. hustling, trying to figure it out. If you had to give somebody 30 seconds on like what they should do or a way that they could go and create wealth, what would your advice to that individual be? Yeah, my first advice is there's a voice inside of you already trust it. Don't. Don't question it just because your dad says you're wrong or your brother says you're a loser or whatever. There is a voice inside of you. Stop trying to figure it out. You already know what it is that your vision is, right? Fall into that 100%. Get obsessed. Get obsessed. Like nobody's ever been obsessed about that thing that you see in your eyes and in your mind and stick with it because that is where your triumph will come from. It might not be the thing, but that thing will lead to the next thing, will lead to the next thing, which will eventually become the thing that's going to make you successful. And if it wasn't for you pursuing that first thought, even if at face value it seems dumb, you wouldn't actually solve the 50th thing. That's going to be the thing that's going to make you successful. So as a 20 to 25-year-old, put the blinders on. Do you 
don't listen to all the BS from people who are not in positions that you want to be in and start listening to people who are in the positions you want to be in. Okay, so let's say I'm, I'm by no means an icon, but I've made it in life and I'm the last person to tell you don't do something. So listen to that. That's also narrative. Yeah, no, and, and I think that's spot on. And from what I've learned in self-development, it's a lot of like getting past the the fear of like, well, I don't want to do that because my friends might think that's weird. Yep. I don't want to do that because my parents think that that's risky. Yep. But maybe where they are, where I don't want to be, so I need to go and do it because that's the reason why they're saying no. It's Maybe that doesn't align with them, and they're not wrong. Yeah, They're just not on the same path that I am. So, I mean, I think that's a, <laughs> a perfect answer for somebody listening. And I'm in that age range, and, like, I've obviously met a lot of people, but I know there's people here that this might be the first episode they click on. And if that goes and changes one person's life and they go and they're successful, then what we just did here is, is, is good and positive. And yeah. that's what I get excited about. Yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah. You've mentioned a few times that you've taken companies public. Yeah. What, what how'd you get into that? I mean, I know sometimes you can't share <laughs> what types of yeah. companies, like g- give me a little bit. Yeah. So I can, I can talk about it. I'm, I mean, I'm under NDAs under certain things, but um, what I can discuss is you need to understand that most companies, um, they suck. <laughs> okay. Like the, most companies, they're just horrible and they have horrible ideas in the context of their solutions. Okay. So like, it's great if we can solve, you know, cancer today, let's do it. Right. But how we go about it is, is so much of what makes or breaks a company. Right. So how I got involved in taking companies public, man, is it actually started out when I had my first sort of uh, newfound wealth from trading, right? I was, I was kind of the mindset, okay, I need to diversify, you know, because I almost, there was an element of me that didn't want to trust that I had done this, right? So it, that was the frame of mind that started this narrative, which later on ended up being completely false and I should have just leaned more into my trading. Yeah. But the point is, um, yeah, I started looking at opportunities to, to diversify the trading capital that I had made. And I started getting in touch with venture capitalism, angel investment, and and literally I, I landed on an idea that that this company was going to go and solve the world's internet thing. Like, so you know how we're all talking about AI right now, yeah. right? We're talking Web 3.0. Some of that stuff's starting to surface to the to, to what we need in terms of like having self-driving cars from Tesla and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, the infrastructure to actually back that ability has to do with Web 3.0. And this was a conversation that has started back in 2015, 2014, when I sort of was in that sort of frame of, of coming into money. So what was interesting about this is, that, you know what, this company wanted to solve the next version of the internet, right? I'm like, okay, to me, this is interesting. And the way they went about it was through green methods. Like they were going to be this green, you know, company with ESG scores to the roof. That's going to let them do great work and get great funding and great support, get great government initiatives. I'm like, wow, this thing looks phenomenal. We looked at their performance and, you know, everything looks fa- fantastic on their investment plan. And uh, I was like, you know what? <laughs> Let's try this, right? I mean, I've never tried this before. The idea is fantastic. And I have money sitting around that I can put into this. I put into it. And what's phenomenal is once they went into that game of understanding, okay, I'm just a small peon amongst many other peons that are raising this capital to take this company public and how you form sort of these intermediate companies called shell companies yeah. in order to take this massive beast public, man, dude, this, some of the stuff I got to learn in that lens on how price fluctuations work in the market, how market making works, which is basically the price you see on the screen and why you see that price and what it's meant to do in you to actually suck your money in phenomenal experience. And it taught me so much about, the fight and flight response within humans and how a market is truly created. And once I got to sort of see the behind the scenes of, of a public company and, and how price swings happen on the stock market for that said company, uh, it brought the retail trading side full circle. And I started seeing the game for it actually is and mind blowing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting how you were so invested in learning about stocks and you knew a lot about trading yeah then you went and saw a different angle to that and learned even more yeah and like like you said i mean i could see how that could have made you way more dangerous than you already were yeah because i I like that term it's like i just want to be dangerous like i need to know enough (laughs) to be dangerous in certain areas and 
I mean, you, they kind of gave you the keys to the back end, the stuff that you usually can't see, and you could go just apply that to, to what you do on a day-to-day. -day. You see it for what it is. So what ends up happening is once you see, like, okay, there's such a big narrative right now among so many young people, too, which might be in your audience, right, where they think that, especially the Forex kids, I make fun of the Forex kids, That's I'm, <laughs> I'm going to say that right now. Um, they're, they're taught the narrative of technical analysis, right? Yeah. Long lines on charts, lacking indicators. You know, if you do this, you do that. You draw, you know, the, the liquidation call. What the, the liquidation that you guys talk about? There's so much that they're learning on the technical side that is truly just market making, mm -hmm. right? And you need to understand the metrics that go into that market making to create the prices you see on the screen to make your decisions, not just draw lines on charts. So once you start seeing the game for what it actually is and that this game is revealed through everything behind the scenes, which is like filing, what the companies are up to, where they're dropping financing on their stock. I mean, I'm starting to get pretty technical with this, yeah. right? But you see this, this within itself might not make sense to a regular person. Well, there is where the success actually lays, right? right? The learn. stuff that most people don't want to learn. I call it sort of like the chicken and broccoli diet of money making. It's not exciting. But that's where millions are made. Billions are made every day on, on Wall Street. Yeah, and fascinating. It's. I feel like that's the differentiator. Like in everything, it's the person who wants to go and learn it and put in the time, and the person that doesn't. And this is the one percent. This is the ninety-nine percent. Yep. And I always think of like the tax code, for example. Mm -hmm. Like it's like nine thousand pages. Yeah. And there's like sixty pages in that nine thousand that are there for you to like go and reduce your taxes mm -hmm. the good accountants will probably go through and read it all and know the ins and outs <laughs> and that's why that accountant charges more yeah but the regular ones are like well i don't need to know all that like i could just do general filing make sure my clients are all buttoned up but i'm gonna go pay double for the guy who's gonna or the gal who's gonna get me money back not illegally, like very legally. Just it's literally written in the code. Correct. It's just that it, most people don't know. And I think that's a perfect example of hey, <laughs> one percent will do and put in the hard work because it's not easy. Like <laughs> it's just it's not gonna be easy, but you will be rewarded for that. Yeah. So it comes down then to why. Why then? Do you want more money, right? I, I, like people make such a wrong um, assumption around money that they think that by having more of it, they're going to stop worrying. And like, and it's such a that's such a lie. Hmm. That's such a scam. And the reason it's a scam is it's it's usually the people who don't have a lot of money who say that. Yeah. Right. If yep. you talk to people with a lot of money, just again the two types. The ones that worry because they might lose everything they've got. Like, oh my God, the markets. There's that version still within the rich, right? Um, and then there's the version that, no, because they know what they're doing. Whatever. Or replenish more money. So the, the worry of money actually only disappears once you understand what you're doing and you have skills. If you don't have skills, yeah, you should probably be, <laughs> you should be shitting yourself, right? Because you are reliant upon a completely... Um, external medium to flow your net worth, your value, your debt, your whatever, right? So going back to what you're saying with the account and, and, and all that stuff, I firmly believe every single person, and I don't care, I don't care how much you make, you need to have at the very basics a fantastic accountant, fantastic lawyer. These two entities work together to ensure that you are maintained um, in, a, in a sort of tip-top shape when it comes to your finances. Now, if you don't bring income skills to those two entities, they're limited in what they can do for you. But if you can then now go and get yourself really educated on how to make a lot of money, those two entities are going to be some of the biggest friends and allies that you can have in this game. Yeah. It's an and, investment is what I call. And I, I, I'm, I'm fortunate enough. I have my best friend, childhood best friend is a lawyer. Cool. And he is, that. that's what he's doing. And my cousin, another could say best friend where one year apart is a cpa and so i i think i'm lucky because i'll have that in my inner circle yeah, man. and i know those two people at the core they're gonna they're gonna be that one percent they're yeah they're not gonna be the 99 that just skates by and and i agree it's like when when you meet with high net worth individuals people doing stuff playing in that other arena <laughs> they love their lawyers and accountants yep. and there's a reason for that yeah systems designed that way man
that's what it is. And I always say that I have one un- unpopular thing that I always say. I'm going to say it to you. Feel free to cut it out if you don't like it. Thanks. But um, I think this system actually wants you to be rich. Most people don't think that. They don't believe that. They think, no, the government wants you to not be rich. And I'm like, no, you're actually very wrong. I'll tell you why. The more participants engage in the game of wealth, the less people have to rely on state capital support. And that's what they want, right? Ultimately, they don't want you on their support system because they don't have any fucking money. <laughs> yeah. they really, right now, how in debt is the United States? Pretty in debt. Right. So it's not a functional system, right? It's the more people that can offload to that and actually be self-sustaining, it's better for the government, which is why the whole game of lobbying even exists. It's That's the way that backside actually exists. Okay, I'm, I'm definitely not cutting that out. It's okay. I'm all it's good. Okay, yeah. I, I love good. I, I love a hot take, and I think people yeah. as well because I think if it's something that is a hot take, people are debating on. Then yeah. I think it's a good point because if it wasn't something that people were debating on, then it's probably not relevant. So I, I, I love that, and I think it's an interesting way to look at it. And I and I th- I think it's great. Um, yeah. um, I I like to think of myself and like I feel like this role of being a host has created more of like being in the middle. Yeah. I don't sway in really any direction. I listen to everything with an open mind. Yeah. And that's made me a better person because it's interesting when you open your mind up because when you're like very this way or very that way, anything you hear from the other side is like you disqualify it immediately. You don't even think about how it could maybe be like oh maybe that is right being in the middle and understanding that there's plenty of right here and plenty of right here it's about how you want to interpret it and you want to go about it has been such an interesting path and this role of being a host has has changed has made that happen because not everybody that sits here is going to share the same opinion as me or the person I talked to before and I always think it's interesting. I love learning about the way people view things and that's a take I've never heard. Yeah. And I think it's a valid take. Yeah, it is. Um, I used to think the system was against me, man. So I so I'm one of the majority in the sense that I used to think well, the system's rigged, right? I mean that's why I'm losing money. Like, <laughs> there was an element of that and it wasn't until I actually crossed what I call the other side of the wealth equation. It's an equation, right? You're on one side or the other of it. Um, and I started seeing the networks and the relationships for what they truly are and, and, and what conversations truly go on behind the scenes. And, and, you know, take my word or don't take it, doesn't matter. But the reality is the less people rely on the system, the, the more powerful that country is and that entity is as a whole, right? Yeah. And you look at some of the richest places in the world. What are we looking at? Places like the UAE, Saudi Arabia, right? Why are they thriving right now? And why are they the up-and-coming capital markets? There's a reason for it. There's less and less people rely on the state. Everyone's thriving. Everyone's at the, at the highest circles, crushing some of the coolest goals in the world. So, yeah, I think there's a chapter to take away from that uh, as a sort of, um, as a mantra and, and adopt that so that you don't ever sit there playing the victim card that money's not meant for you. It's absolutely meant for you. You just have to learn what it takes to get it. I mean, gold. I always like to ask kind of the same question at the end of the episodes, and it goes along with me liking to start at the beginning and kind of work through your journey. Sure. It's what are, what are you excited about in the near future? Like what is next for you as an individual? Yeah, I'm going on camera to say this now, but I'm going to build a good body, man. That's number one. Okay, I, dude. Yeah. Let's... You know, that's, I'm putting it out there. It's, uh, it's a lot of things I'm working through to get there. It's, there's some past stuff with this. Um, but, but I'm starting to see that so much of the disciplines that are associated with all my success everywhere else in my life are like lessons laid in front of me to just have to implement here. Right. It's just yeah. an inner mental game. I call it selective discipline for a reason. Right. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to add this now to my, to my, uh, uh, to my life because it's, I'm excited to exist. I think that's what it is. Once I've, I've gotten to this place now in my life where I'm super ex- excited to exist as a person, I want to try to prolong that while fully respecting the fact that ultimately I might not be in control of the end result, but at least, you know what? I want to thrive in the moments that I'm here. So that's what I'm excited about. I'm excited for you to Thanks. go on that journey and it's it's fun. And again, we talked about it before we started rolling on why I like these in-person episodes, 
is because I get to connect with the individual in the other seat a lot better. And now I go from a spectator to a cheerleader. Thank you. I am now excited <laughs> for you. And I say that to every guest. I know you personally now, even if it's this one hour where most people would be like, you don't know somebody, you've only met them for an hour. Well, I just talked to them about their whole life yeah. for one hour. I know more than the, the typical person. <laughs> And I've spent time researching. So like now I'm a, I'm a cheerleader to this individual because I want to succeed. And I think the only way that I will succeed is by wanting others to succeed as well. Yeah. And I think that's extremely important. So I think it's an amazing what to be because <laughs> I've gotten some insane answers on this. Like, And I think this is one that people that are watching can get behind and be excited. And I'm in that point in my life too. I was an athlete my whole life, always fit and I stopped and I got unfit. I don't even know if yeah. that's a word, but I got, and, I, and I've and i battled that. I've struggled to commit to getting in shape. And right. I'm at that moment in my life too right now where I'm at this inflection point. I'm, I'm working out, but I'm not eating great and the results okay. aren't there, but I'm there and I'm on that You're journey working as well. It. So dude, I, I'm so <laughs> pumped for you. And I know that we'll touch base on this in a few months and both be in the best shape. There you life. go. I love it. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you so much for coming on the show, dude. It's Thanks. been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it.